uh, steam colleagues in, in Europe. Um, <clears throat> well, let's just begin. Uh, the, the seminar is named How Much Data is Enough Data. Uh, typically, our group, um, we're, we're a Canadian college. We're, uh, I don't know, the, 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 I'm not sure what the equivalent in Europe is, but it's like a technical school where we have um, you know, students learning how to program, uh, students learning how to, well, actually we have you know, how to make beer or how to make wine. We also have um, you know, some basic, very, very basic kind of hort and agriculture programs. Uh, I came here in 2001 as an industry expert in virtual reality because they had just bought a very gigantic uh, virtual reality um, installation. And so I was in charge of taking that and meeting, um, working with the local manufacturing community because we're in Welland, which is um, one of the, at the time that I came here, was one of the steel centers um, in the world. I think it's, it's um, uh, cousin city is Sheffield, England, where they make different kinds of steel. Anyway, so when I got here, it was about uh, virtual reality and uh, you know, working with the manufacturing community. Over time, that evolved into a business and it split off from the college. So I was left to figure out what the next steps were. And that was around 2006. So, uh, it's not moving. Uh, so let's do this. There we go. Um, so on your left is a picture of probably the last remaining picture of an engine that we built probably 2004. It was called the Vineyard Engine. Uh, it was attached to a specific vineyard in Vineland, Ontario, and the initial objective of the project was there's, of the 70,000 vines that are in that um, vineyard, there was a significant number of dead vines. And so we sent out uh, our GIS person at the time uh, with a handheld GPS unit, and he went vine to vine to vine, figuring out uh, positioning and listing whether the vine was alive, dead, or just missing. So we put together, based on that data, we put together this simulation. Every vine in the vineyard is simulated by a little flat picture of a vine, and it's colored based on whether it's alive, dead, or missing, and also colored by the varietals. So there are about nine varietals in that vineyard. The topography, uh, as you see on the right, was a LiDAR-based, um, we had, we had Nova Scotia Community College come in with their Optronics LiDAR and they gave us about eight points per square meter. So we modeled the entire surface of the vineyard, uh, created the 3D model, and you were, you were able to fly around it and query each of the vines. Uh, this thing right. Yeah. My aim is bad. Uh, later on, we moved into more Google Earth. I think everybody did around that time because the Google Earth tools were just fantastic. Um, so, by, but by that point, we had about 300,000 vines that we were, uh, had linked up in the database. Uh, here you can see an example shot from uh, one, of the view, one of the views of our own vineyard uh, in the back. That little gray blob up to kind of off to the right of center, just above the pop-up window, is actually our Niagara College, uh, Niagara on the Lake campus. And we were following, at that time, the work of Andy Reynolds, uh, who's a viticulture specialist um, at uh, Brock University, which is just up the hill behind the vineyard. Um, his work is on the right, and what he did was takes, take vines or sentinel vines, uh, G GPS map throughout the vineyard, um, and basically the colors that you see behind are actually flavors. So it's, uh, or at least flavor chemicals. They're, I think, free volatile terpenes. Um, and from what, what he did in that map, he broke that vineyard, which used to create one bottle of wine, um, to create five. Uh, one of which was a spectacular wine of, you know, 50 bucks a bottle, and the other ones were kind of close to vinegar. In our own vineyard, um, we got into, around 2006, we got into sensor networks. Uh, because it seemed like the new cool technology. So I put 16 of them in a very small kind of 10 acre region of uh, our own vineyard. And so each one is positioned about 30 by 40 um, meters apart. Uh, I wasn't expecting kind of what we saw. Um, you can see from this, this image, this was actually an animation sequence that we created around that time. And it shows uh, two of the tiles 
um, are very hot and they're right next to a lagoon um, which is off to the right of the image and they were throughout the season the hottest um, but the rest of them the rest of the time uh, the variability that we found from these sensors um, was really kind of kind of extraordinary so the on the lower right is a typical uh, summer day for the sensors in the network so there's 16 sensors and as you see at night they all kind of kind of collect together into one kind of uh, very smooth very clean path but the moment the sun comes up they're all over the place now some people have mentioned that that could be photonic effect it could be a whole bunch of things but uh, that was very late in the season and the sensors were very well hidden by uh, the, the uh, canopy at the time uh, a simplified view is right above it that's about a month worth of data um, and it, you can see the diurnal variations and the ups and downs uh, we harness the entire uh, system into an interface web-based interface at the time that we call pragmatic for precision agriculture automatic so again it's us building tools to try and help the local farmers visualize data all in one shot and so what it included was two different radars one was um, Canadian one is American the goes east imagery and then some of the rain sat imagery uh, as well as a picture it's hard to see in the middle but that's our Niagara on the Lake campus and some of these sensors were actually inside the compound so you can see the little numbers um, so in a nutshell this is kind of um, this is kind of what uh, has, has been a repeating pattern so we'll we'll put some sensors out we'll invent some kind of way of or use some kind of way of collecting data try to bring it together into a useful set of tools and this pattern we repeat over and over and currently we have the crop portal the RTAG site and a bunch of things that uh, I will hopefully show you shortly uh, just to get a little sciency at the moment uh, or at least for for a second this is some work this is more related to my early thesis work or my PhD thesis work which was uh, in multifractal analysis of radar uh, returns but this is an ensemble spectra for the 16 sensors in the field and so they show the minus five-thirds uh, Kamalgarov scaling laws so um, we expect the signals to be very violent very turbulent very uh, up and down spiky um, that kind of kind of thing um, beyond this analysis um, this was actually done by Sean Lovejoy at McGill um, that uh, used to be my thesis supervisor and um, so it just basically is kind of um, you know when you talk about how much data is enough data this kind of analysis shows that you'll never have enough data um, but again that's not practical because you know with 16 sensors in the field some of them got chewed up by you know farm equipment so it's it's not really practical to try and you know um, put too many sensors so it's it ends up being kind of a balance and the question is really you know how many do you need in order to find what you want to find so again another temperature trace from the early pragmatic system or the uh, sensors in the vineyard and these are uh, anomalies that we began to to find as we were looking at the data because we're collecting data at one minute real-time resolution so we would suddenly find these just enormous temperature drops and this is on May 3rd of 2012 where you have this great big huge 14 14 degree drop in it was under five minutes and it was a question of you know what significance do these things have the project at the time was part of trying to figure out um, uh, the viability of hazelnuts in Ontario uh, whether they um, can survive kind of these temperature shocks because the um, the root stock or the cloning stock that they use for hazelnuts in Ontario is based on Tona di Gifondi which is the uh, Turkish hazelnut tree and really the what we're trying to do is create um, uh, or figure out whether uh, like I'm, I'm fairly sure most of you will know the name Ferrero and they moved into Canada and they have a very large plant very large plant just uh, just west of here and it's uh, they're basically because of its success they're looking for more and more places to grow so they began to initiate studies into um, how how and whether these uh, trees can survive here and so this was part of that study and 
Um, this ran day and night throughout the winter, and we had one of the worst winters ever, and none of the plants seemed to even care. So they were all alive the next season. So I guess you know the answer is that uh, hazelnuts in Ontario are a good mix. Um, this one, this particular time trace is, is fairly interesting because the uh, sudden drop you see at the end of uh, at the end of that long kind of um, meandering path down to sub-zero temperatures. That final drop killed off the entire Ontario apple industry. So nearly a billion dollars worth of damage came from that one little shock alone. So if you look at uh, uh, apple exports from that particular year in 2012, you suddenly see this huge anomaly where there are basically no exports. And uh, so a system that, that identified the shocks and would have tracked something like that and been usable as an early warning system. Um, around the time, around 2009, so we're moving forward in time a little bit here, um, we began switching our research to grains. And so it became less about temperature sensors and more about um, ingesting data from combines and working with yield analysis. At the time, uh, we were working with a, a fairly well-known researcher, at least in Ontario anyway. He was a, um, a researcher with the Ontario Ministry of Ag and had a theory or was had been pursuing a relationship between field topography and the yield uh, that you get in grains. Um, the, the, the promise of this kind of relationship is that uh, you can, if, if, if this holds, if this kind of relationship holds, you can immediately jump a farmer into variable rate farming based on, an, on a simple elevation map. So all they have to do is run their combine or get some LiDAR data or something of their field and their ability, they're suddenly able to generate prescriptions that match the patterns of the yield. So we began investigating that and Sarah did a lot of that work um, and she can answer any questions that will come up. Um, but the basic idea, and this is, uh, these are you know rather fancier charts than we began with, um, they're based on the elevation data is from uh, is combine based, and the the image on the left is created by a tool called Landmapper, which is uh, the product of Dr. Bob McMillan from Alberta. He's a fairly well known soil pedologist, um, but he created this wonderful tool called Landmapper, and it, this is a uh, one of the outputs. There are about sixteen others, and this is a four class landform map. Um, and the reason I'm putting it side by side with corn yield from the same field is you can begin visually, you can begin to see some correlations between uh, landforms and um, the yield, yield patterns that are in the field. Uh, and so this is the kind of the work that has been uh, occupying us fairly heavily from about 2009 to just recent, well, to now actually, because this, this is one of the main kind of thrusts of our uh, portal is uh, to continue to work with this relationship and um, uh, kind of solidify it, I guess, in the minds of farmers. Uh, farmers, I don't know how many of you deal directly with farmers. We have several that we deal with directly, um, but they move rather slowly and cautiously. They're very conservative in, in uh, uh, how quickly they will adopt new ideas. So this is basically, this is output from line mapper. This is the four class line map overlaid on the 3D topography of the field. Um, basically pits, gullies, it identifies. Uh, so I, I put it on a 3D map just to show uh, how, how it basically picks out these um, topography features. Uh, correspondingly, uh, the same points on the yield map. You can see the dark greens are the high yield, the reds are the lower yields. Uh, and then if, I mean, it's really not good, we're not good enough to simply have a visual representation. Um, so we get, got into uh, the science of the whole thing. And I'll describe our process for, um, for processing yield data, but this, this is basically related to the whole premise of, of uh, whether yield is related to topography. So this graph is very surprising, because this is, uh, if you take those two maps, and you, and you divide or segregate out um, the yield that's associated with each landform and then form a distribution, normalize it, and plot it, 
you get this. And I've left the bottom uh, non-normalized. So those are the actual bushels per acre um, that you see. So in, in a sense, what it says is the tops of knolls, um, perhaps I should go back for a second uh, just to um, clarify some things. Um, the light yellow are tops of knolls, uh, greens are upper side slopes, blues are lower side slopes, and dark, dark blues are pits. Now, uh, there's a theory associated with this that says that tops of knolls are you know, bad producers Upper side slopes, they're not great, but the lower side slopes and the pits are where you, where you will find most of your yield. So if you do a distributional analysis, you get a shock. Is that basically what this says is the tops of knolls um, are capable of producing um, you know, high yields and the, the pits are capable of producing equally low yields. So um, this is true whether you're using uh, this is another a similar graph, but for a different type of seed. So the first graph, these are multi, uh, single trait uh, seeds from early in the millennium. Uh, and these are multi trait seeds that came about a decade later. Uh, what you actually have to do uh, in order to find the differences is to integrate uh, relative to, say, an average, uh, the average yield of the field to find where most of your contributions are coming from. And so once I have done this, it turns out the yield performance or yield probability um, is really what follows topography rather than direct yield. And so you can kind of see it here in the sense that the, in, if you integrate these distributions forward, um, this is landform one and that's landform, um, you know, the landform four part or landform, actually landform three is the most dominant. Um, Adds, these parts add considerably to your yield, and this is where most of the differences are. Um, but they move, as, as you can tell, for a given field, they move back and forth and are kind of sinuous. Um, so you really have to just integrate it forward to find um, the relationship you want. And this basically tells you, uh, using, even using partial fractions of the distribution, that, that landform three, just as Doug Aspinall had suggested, um, is the major producer or the highest probability yielding um, uh, area of the field. So that means the landforms are a fairly effective way of, of breaking up your uh, yield into specific management zones. Uh, just to step back for a second, LandMapper um, is, a, is a, I mean, to me, is a brilliant tool. Um, it's, it took us a while to get it from uh, Bob's version into a version that would run in the portal but it'll generate uh, local, and, or, uh, local, global watersheds, wetness index, aspect ratios, anything that, that we need in order to uh, act as a layer in uh, helping with precision ag. And so now we've made those layers available to the local science, scientific community, kind of so that they're now easy to get. We're beginning to see a lot of activity from, our, uh, from both government and universities uh, wanting to use the layers to um, you know, test out new theories. Uh, we became involved, um, it was mainly through our work on building um, the crop portal, which was, uh, in one sense, just a, a way of um, collecting all sorts of data together, um, that we became involved with this PAO project, or Precision Agriculture Advancement for Ontario. And so with our government friends and some researchers and a lot of the, the industry, uh, we began to work on how to create management zones properly. So at the time, one of the um, uh, CCAs or certified crop uh, advisors who worked for one of these uh, companies basically said, look, we're drawing lines on maps and we don't really understand what the science is behind them. So this project was put together back in 2013 and we began to participate. So we uh, what we brought to the table, at least initially, was just a way to, to store data. So we could just store these data types. And then we began to build the upload. I mean, obviously, we needed to upload data. So upload actually you know, has an arrow that goes back into here as well. But typically, what you would do is you would uh, take, your, take your data. And, and since this slide was created uh, about eight years ago, there are a lot of new data types that we can, in, we can up, uh, include. So we had the upload cleaning. Um, basically, it's becoming more and more sophisticated. The gridding and mapping, we actually borrowed that from um, 
Alex McBratney's crew in, in Sydney, and we were using Vesper originally. Uh, and then we began, then it was, uh, we took a, I think we took the block creating algorithms from R and implemented them as well. Uh, and then we began to create uh, some yield products. So standard yield index, working with the elevation maps uh, in preparation for land mapper, at least, you know, when the slide was done, now the elevation actually leads to a whole bunch of land mapper outputs. Uh, and we were, began to play with variable rate tools, um, a very simple one that we built called VRX, and a much more complex one called RRX, which is a reservoir-based um, prescription algorithm. And then to feedback um, to uh, basically the advisors on where to sample, where to take measurements, and where to, where to put your test plots. And so all that's part of now uh, the PAO project. So just a quick... Uh, here's some raw data. Uh, this is it clean, so the definition is much higher. And this is it creaked. So these are the maps that we typically, the creaked data are the maps that we typically work with on a day-to-day -day basis. They, um, the portal allows us to, or the, the, one of the abilities we worked into the portal was if you have 10, you know, 10 raw images that represent a sequence of corn from the last 20 years on this field, you can stack it and creak it all together so that all of the cells line up and you can do um, an ana spot analysis on any cell within the field. Um, so the early cleaning was just simple, you know, outlier, get rid of the bottom, get rid of outliers at the bottom, get rid of outliers at the top, and then your distribution spreads out and you can see uh, more details. We had some problems with that because people uh, were, you know, didn't want to actually remove yield from the map in a direct way. So I created something called the Delta Clean, which was based on some of my earlier fractal work, uh, which was just, it's just based on point-to-point -point differencing in the field, so that uh, we can do point-to-point -point difference velocity, azimuth, and yield. And if we just take azimuth and velocity, we end up removing a lot of the outliers um, that cause the yield map to look a little strange sometimes, like you get, you know, yields of 16,000 or yields of, um, you know, 0 0.00001. Typically, they will be associated with anomalies in the velocity and azimuth as well. And so you end up removing 99% of, of yield points without ever actually having to touch yield uh, specifically. So it's a very kind of oblique way of, of uh, cleaning the data, but also extremely effective. Um, just to give a sense, um, a lot of the uh, we, what we've been talking about is related to patterns. This is a field called Home West, and this is 10 years worth of data uh, from 96 to about 2007. Okay, so 11 years of data. And so each of these distributions is tied to um, basically uh, the identical pattern. Look how the distributions have changed. Uh, low, high, uh, multi-trait, single trait, doesn't really matter. The, the patterns uh, look very similar from year to year. So if we normalize everything, again, it doesn't, really, uh, it doesn't really add much in, but it does give a very uh, interesting uh, view of single trait versus multi-trait seeds. The multi-trait seeds are, have very wide distributions back into the low end, so they're, they're raising yields in the low end and pushing yields or skewing yields way towards the forward edges of what the single trait uh, does. Uh, so they make a very wide distribution. Um, one of the first analyses, just I tried to figure out, um, just um, you know, whether there, what it, what's the pattern and what's the noise. So the easiest way for me to do to do that was to create for each year of the field. Uh, let's say this is all corn data, um, to create a pattern of above and below the average. And so if you take above and below the average for each year, you add them all together, you get this map, which I call a yield probability index. Because these, the red areas uh, are always underperforming the average, and the green areas are always overperforming the average. So you have this contrast between always underperforming and always overperforming. And if you look at it, it, like what we've discovered before, the performance is what follows the landforms more than just straight yield. Because straight yield is going back and forth and causing um, issues. Convergence of the yield patterns to specific areas. Um, this graph kind of shows, you know, initially you only have one graph, so you have 40 and 60%. Uh, but ultimately, after you've added um, six, six of these binary graphs together, 
you end up with you know, areas of about 20% 20, 20 for the high and 10% for the yield. And that's very different for every field. So every field needs to have this kind of analysis done for it to figure out um, exactly where your uh, specific or fixed performance areas are. Uh, this is a tool that's been worked into the portal. Um, the distributional way of looking at what you just did um, doing uh, like with the geometric construction, this is, um, again, this is 10 years of corn data from the same field. Um, basically, you do some calculations. So here's each of your, uh, on the left are all of the, the yields. Um, just to the right of that, under the red bar, is their YPI membership, um, which is basically just whether they're above or below the average. And so you either put a zero or a one. If it's above the average, you put zero, uh, a one. If you below, you put zero. And then the YPI level is just the sum of those numbers. Uh, and then you plot that against the yield average and you create YPI um, kind of memberships or clusters. And on the right hand side are the distribution functions. And you can see how when you plot the distributions of the YPI clusters, so there's uh, seven columns and seven distributions, you can see kind of the, how the distributions move from lower, lower left to upper right. Um, and so that's what showing that the ensemble average distribution is actually being partitioned into a bunch of sub-distributions, each of which is uh, associated with an area of the field. And so here's a drawing showing basically just the low part is these, these whites. And the dark one is, well, that was an unfortunate choice of colors. You can barely see the thing. But the top part is related to these areas, smaller uh, sub-areas of high yield. Now, in order to fit with most machinery, because we're, we're basically, our job is to focus mostly on the farmer and not on kind of the academic aspects of this. Um, so most machinery can't handle more than three different layers uh, or three different levels of fertilizer. So take those initial distributions um, and then add them, you know, add the bottom two or the bottom three together, the middle two and the top, you know, three, whatever works. Uh, I typically do it so that I have a minimal overlap between the low and the, and the high, which to me justifies treating, you know, low, low areas or low performing areas differently from high performing areas or basically, you know, uh, how to do management zones. And so that makes the map far more tractable and easier to deal with. Um, so based on that, we created a variable rate system. Um, you can see your four levels. And really what we do is we, the farmer provides a target average and then we generate um, a solution. Here's one, this is one particular case that was odd for us because the YPI algorithm really, it, it just picks out the high points of the field. That's really all it's for. And uh, this, in this particular case, the farmer argued with us that this, the area in blue uh, was the garbage part of his field. It didn't produce because, I mean, there was sand that couldn't possibly produce anything. And after a while, um, he began to realize that that actually was the highest performing part of his field. Um, so we had, you know, you, you count your uh, progress in terms of small successes. So this is a variable rate map, or variable rate prescription map for nitrogen. Uh, we've gotten recently into some work where, um, uh, where we're trying to assess how much fertilizer fall, fell into what watershed and how that uh, could potentially drain out into local water systems. Um, so it's part of kind of the more, you know, we know the legislation's coming down the track for clean water because of the problems that we have in Ontario with Lake Erie, which turns, you know, various shades of blue and green and, and smells really bad uh, over the summer, um, largely because, well, I mean, it's not, it's not so much the farmers because uh, nobody's really blaming anybody at the moment, but you know the legislation's coming. so having the tools in place to figure out, um, you know, kind of that effluent and how much pollution and what went where. And I mean, we had a water problem in a town called Walkerton where a lot of people died because of uh, manure that was placed on a field that managed to, you know, through a freak rainstorm float into one of the water intakes for the local town's water supply. And so with systems like this, we'd be able to track that almost immediately. And in, in fact, probably move to prevent it beforehand. So we're getting more towards the uh, current day um, and the return of sensor networks. So we haven't talked about those in a while. 
and we hadn't dealt with them in years. Uh, a local investor came by and said, well, I really like that work you were doing with sensor networks way back when. So the, the staff on the left um, that looks like it's made out of duct tape and wires uh, is made out of duct tape and wires and is based on kind of really simple Arduino uh, electronics. Um, we can build pretty much anything now. And so what we've done is we've uh, installed several of these sensor systems across southern Ontario. And um, from each, we're collecting, you know, temperature and humidity at three different heights so we can predict inversions. Um, and so here are the, some of the measurements on the lower right. Um, they're basically real time and they're one second resolution. So this data is streaming in across rural networks at one second um, resolution and there's, what, about 10 streams from each sensor. So now that it works, we're gonna go and do it uh, big time. Uh, we've also tapped into local radar sources. This is uh, an image from the NextRad radar system in the States, which is wonderful because they publish all of their data. So we just scrape it, um, turn it into um, something usable. The little window on the right uh, allows you to specify a location. So if you have a lat latitude and longitude for your farm uh, and, a, and a time and date um, range, you just hit search and it'll give you the radar rainfall estimates for that point um, for the entire database of data, which is now up to somewhere like, I don't know, 200 and 250 million records. Uh, we suck in a lot of data and it goes and we're building, uh, I mean, the databases are growing really fast. So back to some of the shocks, these were recorded, um, I guess, spring last year. Uh, again, so they're still here uh, at one second resolution. Um, you can see most of the detailed structure and we now have the added, added convenience of humidity so that we know that when the temperature drops that the humidity goes up and um, you know they tend to balance each other out and so um, we can begin to build predictive tools based on um, some of these analyses where um, if it's really dry you know the temperature is going to drop so you get those um, you know uh, really strong night inversions and uh, other things that, that tend to kill crops uh, as was recently demonstrated in France unfortunately um, the other thing, uh, you know, one of the issues is obviously a data glut. Um, this is the output from that one sensor system. So these are all the signals, temperature, humidity, light levels. Um, there's an anemometer and we're putting in a soil moisture probe. So this is what you're getting from one tower, uh, just put on one slide. And so on the left is the day and on the right is the nighttime. And so you can see how the temperatures begin to drop uh, but are counterbalanced by the fact that the humidities go up. The humidities tend to go up to saturation, uh, where, where, whereupon the temperature inversions and cooling, cooling at the ground tends to stop because you have that thermal balance um, that, you know, when you're, if you're a golfer, your feet are all wet in the morning because, you know, you've got dew all over the place. Um, and that's really the balance that keeps it from, uh, keeps the temperature from falling too fast or too far. Um, so, you know, this being the age that it is and the fascination with uh, robots and uh, you know, moving technology, thanks to cell phones, which have miniaturized pretty much everything. This is another Arduino based system. It's got a radio, it's got a GPS, it's got light, it's got temperature, and you can run it all over the ground and measure the temperature. The, the stick on the right hand side of the thing is, a, is a, kind of like a whip antenna. It's got a thermistor at the top so it can measure it, Part of the interest was being, you know, if you're going to take a thermal image of a, of a vineyard, um, part of the image you get ground and part of the image you get canopy. And so it's uh, kind of uh, integrating the two together in the image. Um, this was kind of uh, a quick idea to see if we can pull the two apart. So the, the, uh, the ground sensor uh, is about three inches from the ground um, and the top sensor is about 1.2 meters up. And so it measures kind of the temperature of the canopy. Um, and so when you, when you integrate those and uh, map them, which is you know, what the portal is, is really there for, is to take a whole bunch of points and give you a nice creaked uh, regular map. Uh, the, the map on the left is at the ground and the map on the, uh, sorry, the map on the left is at, is at altitude, is at the canopy height. 
and the map on the right is at the ground and there's you know a six degree difference in the averages between the two um, all of that is integrated now into our crop portal and so here's a kind of a quick view of uh, an elevation map and the distributions of elevations um, that you can find in um, this new uh, tool that we built. So again, full circle, um, we started by building tools and interfaces to allow people to explore data. We've been continually doing that. Uh, the way we operate is really the science uh, it comes from the, our little management group and the programmers are kind of uh, tangential and so they're really only interested in being better programmers so they can get better jobs with Microsoft and building games. So for the time, you know, for the time being that they're with us, they kind of humor us to work on this farming stuff uh, while they figure out faster and faster ways to move data around, which is going to be more relevant to how many monsters you can deal with later on or something. Anyway, so uh, that's kind of it in a nutshell. If there's any questions, uh, I'd be happy or the team would be happy to, to answer any of them. Duncan for the very interesting uh, presentation. Um, I don't know if uh, I'm sure that many of you may have questions, so you can um, write them down to the chat box, and I will speak them out so that um, Dr. Duncan or uh, uh, Greg McLean can uh, answer them. No questions? Princess Monster Truck. Well, that's whatever you mean. That's whatever you mean. Then the presentation was very <laughs> straightforward and everything has been um, understood. Um, if there are no questions whatsoever, um, of course the webinar has been uh, recorded and uh, it will be um, sent out um, uh, the link with an email. Um, so if you have no questions, uh, thank you very much for joining our webinar and uh, we hope that uh, you find it uh, as interesting as we did and uh, we will keep you informed for any upcoming uh, webinars.